you, I, I actually, I took the time to watch a few minutes of that, uh, the video of my talk uh, that I delivered back then. And I must say, um, I'm not sure we were optimistic enough uh, in, in many ways. Um, there's been so much change, so much change since then that I think some folks may have predicted. Um, but the fact that we are now a mobile world um, where we're creating more content every day than the day before is just is just staggering, and I don't think anybody could have uh, could have predicted this. A few people were predicting the the challenges of misinformation. We'll see a video later today from Howard Rheingold, who was sort of on that path as early as 1993 that these tools could be misused. Uh, as you've advanced in public relations in Toronto and now at Shift in Boston, how are you addressing this? Well, it's a great topic. I mean, obviously, the it, it, you can't control the conversation, you know, no matter what. And the, the media themselves have become highly opinionated sources for the most part of uh, that, you know, with, you know, sharing views that represent in many cases, um, partisan opinion. Um, and so we as individual citizens have, have an obligation to ourselves, if we're interested in objectivity, to look at stories from all angles um, and, and to attempt to understand the perspectives of, of all sides. Um, I, I think it's shift that the best thing you can do is, is literally um, and with our clients is, is get a really good handle on who it is that you intended and need to talk with um, to understand where their heads are at and to understand quite frankly that you're never going to make everybody happy um, and any attempt to do so will only create further uh, alienation amongst some part of the audience um, so it's just I, I don't know that there's a, again it's a, an easy way around it I was actually on a page society webinar yesterday and they were talking about this topic as well. Um, the, the real trick is making sure that you are very careful in um, uh, judging uh, anything uh, at face value and that you, you do your homework. And from a, from a client perspective, I think they need to be doing uh, that as well. I saw that uh, Shift had done a reboot playbook. This has been a difficult time for uh, agencies and brands in terms of uh, revenue and in terms of furloughs. Uh, how are you addressing that? <laughs> well, um, yeah, it's, it's funny. So I, I am part of Shift as part of the Avenir Global Network. And um, we have seven agencies uh, in North America and Europe. Um, three of them are doing exceptionally well. Uh, two and uh, three of them are doing pretty well and one is not doing as well as the others but is certainly on the rebound and that last one is shift um, we have basically because of the various services that clients buy uh, and and the client mix that you represent um, you you were more or less vulnerable and so shift is a technology uh, public relations firm principally with a strong consumer arm as well um, our consumer arm was skewed to hospitality, uh, and needless to say, that business took a bit of a, a bit of a hit. Um, and I'll come back to that in a second because there's some phenomenal work that was being done during that time in that in that area. Uh, and then a large chunk of our business is technology and B two B. And within that particular group, um, we had a third of our clients um, had business models that were quite frankly disrupted and gone, exploded uh, as a result of the pandemic. And because they're fairly early stage uh, in pre-IPO shops, uh, liquidity became an issue for many and, uh, and so on. Um, and so we approached them and all clients with the idea of we want to help you know, get, th get through this together. Uh, we approached many clients with uh, an opportunity to reduce fee and attempt to uh, keep relationships solid. Um, and uh, and so on, but we also have a, a select group of clients that absolutely thrived during the pandemic. Uh, Citrix being a great example of that because they happen to be manufacturers of te of technology that enables uh, remote working, um, and, and so they've done phenomenally well. And so it's a, it's a good mix. But um, we saw the trough for us as a business in uh, June and July. 
uh, a rebound beginning in August and September was phenomenal. Um, so we're not yet back fully to pre-pandemic levels, but we're, uh, we're getting there. Um, and, uh, you know, sadly, yes, we did have to furlough some people um, and convert uh, a handful of those into permanent layoffs. Um, but we, fortunately, most of those folks have found jobs again. Um, and we're now hiring once more. You were spot on 10 years ago with the idea that we were going to need a lot of social media managers, community managers. And it seems as though, I mean, our work in the social media lab with rural communities, that just continues to be a need to have people who, who know what they're doing in these spaces. Yeah, it's, it's funny because the, um, it's actually been the subject of debate at many agencies for sure. And I think many client organizations as well. Um, you know, if you think back 10 years ago, um, first off, only one in three of us had a mobile phone. Um, we're operating in a 3G world, not a 5G world. Data plans were still expensive. Um, and, you know, things like, you know, yes, YouTube existed and Instagram may or may not have existed back then, but they've all sort of, you know, gone on and, and done their... Uh, uh, and taken over our entire uh, entire lives since. So the, the the debate that we've had is, do you need social media managers anymore? Or is that just fundamental to everybody's job in our business? Um, is the knowledge and, and, and the ability to sort of uh, successfully and easily navigate uh, the various platforms? Where I do think you need the expertise still for sure um, is in um, at, at a highest possible level to make sure that you understand the various nuances that the uh, and changes that are being in, uh, introduced by the platforms on a regular basis, um, because those can dramatically impact uh, obviously client planning, um, you know, and client initiatives. And so I think it, you've got to stay on top of those for sure. But by and large, community management, so to speak, has become part of everybody's job. At least the chip has. It seems to me that ten years ago we were starting to get a handle on data but that in the intervening years, we've gotten a lot better. Uh, certainly the academic books that have come out uh, by some of my colleagues have gotten a lot better in terms of goals, planning, strategy, tactics, and sort of the long play building that relationship that you talked about. Yeah, they have, including your book, by the way. Um, you know, I think that uh, you might as well plug yourself here uh, in terms of what uh, the analytics piece. I think we're getting better at it. Um, I, I do think that the uh, it's no longer a mystery that we need to be aware of it. Um, and uh, the tools that are available to uh, to everyone in public relations and beyond, um, you know, have gotten significantly more sophisticated and significantly, frankly, easier to use as well. Um, and, and so I think there's no excuse for not measuring today. Um, that said, I, I still see uh, a number of plans and programs um, that are requested by either the client side or created in some cases by, by our teams that are lacking cogent goals, you know, that aren't really focused on what are we trying to accomplish here and how do we know if we get there? Um, so I, I do think that remains a, a hurdle that we have to sort of continually work on. Um, but the, the adage of, um, uh, and I like to use this quote because there's a friend of mine at Edelman that gave it to me a while ago. It's, you know, we're talking one night and he goes, you know, we don't get paid to win. We get paid to try. Uh, and that was the old school PR, which is like, you know, earn media, you don't control it, you don't control what happens and so on. And I think today we get paid to win. Uh, I think that if you're not helping a client win and you can't prove it and demonstrate your value, that the likelihood of you sustaining that relationship over a, uh, an extended period of time is not great. At the same time, it seems like we still need to be critical consumers of data that um, we maybe, you know, there's, there's still a, a tendency to, to gravitate to vanity metrics, to be controlled by Facebook, Instagram, and the other, other platforms. Yeah, I mean, for sure. And a lot of that, honestly, is driven by the very tops of, of uh, organizations. Um, because I don't know that leadership at the, at the corporate level is, is fully aware of what is possible. And, and so they say, you know, listen, I want to be above the fold in the front, you know, in the business section of the New York Times. Great. You know, that to them is success. 
um, let alone that that section isn't read as much as anything online, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we need to, we need to do a job educating leadership to say, here's what's possible. Uh, we need to make it simple for people, uh, you know, to do that, um, you know, as we do. Um, and we need to work with clients really carefully to say, what are we trying to accomplish and how are you judged and, and measured? You know, so we've actually shifted in some ways to performance-based comp uh, with many of our clients. And so we attach a percentage of our overall earnings and compensation to how well we help them accomplish their goals. Um, and so we know clearly up front what we need to accomplish. Uh, we evaluate and revisit it every quarter. Um, and, uh, you know, the nice part is it keeps us very focused on hitting the mark. Uh, and I'm pleased to say with the first client we introduced this with uh, six quarters ago, uh, we've never scored below 100 uh, out of 100. Uh, our most recent quarter, we scored 160. So um, there's definitely incentive in it to both perform against, you know, against objectives, but uh, it keeps you on your toes. And I think that's a really good thing. The old radio engineer in me wants to talk about signal to noise ratio and the fact that there is so much noise in these spaces. And I think it was brought up in our pre-roll video last hour that for creative people, artists, musicians, it's not that easy to monetize what you're trying to do in these spaces. No, it's not easy for anyone to break through in these spaces, period, right? I think, you know, and again, I'm not sure a two-year-old number, but I believe that, you know, on average, uh, as individuals, we're exposed to 3,000 pieces or more of content per day uh, in, in some way, shape, or form. And think about how do you break through, you know, in, with that much noise out there, you know, for anybody? And um, I tell you, it, it's difficult, but the, the, again, I'll, I'll tie it back to you have to work harder on the front end to craft a message that is going to resonate with people and that you know is gonna resonate with people. So we've just started using a tool out of the UK called Relative Insight. That's, that's one, one example, I don't know if you've heard of this or not, but um, it actually can take all the content that is publicly available uh, on a client and their competitors, analyze the narrative and the, and the messaging and, and the language being used by each, figure out what is common and what is not. And what you find with the vast majority of uh, of businesses out there is that every competitor is saying the exact same thing. So there's no way you're going to break through it if you do that. And that's why I think you, you know, the front end work that you do to analyze what's being said um, and, and figure out where that white space may exist for you to break through is so very critical. Um, and it's just not something that we, uh, I don't think that we work hard enough at uh, because the immediate knee jerk reaction for us and all of us in news is to jump in and, um, and again, think you know, idea first as opposed to strategy first. And the strategy really comes in understanding what, you know, what, where that space is that you can occupy. At the individual level, Rick, do you at all worry about this social exchange we have, basically free access to these platforms in exchange for our personal data? <laughs> At the individual, I think all of us should, should be concerned about it to some degree. Um, you know, I think that we are all exposed or we are all potentially exposed because of everything that we've done. Um, and there are an awful lot of bad actors out there who would like nothing more than to basically hack into your accounts. And if they thought you had some money or something to offer a value uh, to do something with that. And, um, we're, we're seeing some of that for sure in our clients, but data breaches are real. Um, they are uh, hurtful. Uh, they can destroy businesses. Um, and they're also going to happen to everybody all the time. Uh, you know, and so it, it's almost like you can't be, uh, you know, you can't be afraid of it, but it's, um, uh, it, it, I think just, we need to be cautious. Let's, let's put it that way. And it, it's like, Every new day and everything that we learn from our clients is um, just a further reinforcement that we need to take better care of our own data, um, you know, as individuals and as companies for that matter. Um, but in any, in any data breach, at least that I've dealt with so far, the easiest and, and most likely culprit in all of them is human error and, and simply people getting lazy and sloppy. 
Um, and so I think it's just understanding where, where your vulnerabilities are and dealing with them up front, uh, and that's the best way to protect yourself. But I also think that understand that it may happen and be prepared for it is, is also the way that we, uh, we, we speak with our clients too. On the flip side for industry, for advertising, um, promoted posts, Facebook in particular has done a remarkable job of developing geo demographic, psychographic data that allows rather surgical targeting, right? So that's for good or, or bad. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, it is phenomenal in terms of what, what you can physically accomplish with, uh, with much of the digital uh, and social advertising that's out there. I mean, we were uh, engaged by a client up in Canada uh, a few years back who wanted to uh, influence a conversation that was going on in City Hall. And so we literally geofenced City Hall um, and were able to do that and sort of have that part of the conversation. And that basically allows you to understand every mobile phone that's activated inside the building and then basically geofence neighborhoods, um, you know, after, after the fact. So it's, it's, I mean, the technology is remarkable. The question is, is how you use it and, and what, if any, regulation will be put in place to do this. And Canada, in my experience up there, in, in my five years up there, is a much more regulated environment um than the united states and i think that to the extent that there are no no safeguards in charge we really do rely on the likes of facebook and basically independent industry associations to self-regulate and anytime you do that you the bad actors have license to to get away with uh, things until they're caught 10 years ago it seems to me we had a hint of what was coming and what came in terms of influencers, celebrity influencers, micro influencers, first on Instagram, uh, now on TikTok and Snapchat and other platforms. How has that impacted uh, modern PR? Well, I, I think, so the first thing that's impacted modern PR the most is the introduction of paid media period. Because I think that if you looked at the PRSA's code of ethics and so on back 15 years ago, the notion of paying for anything in PR was actually unethical or seen as unethical, whereas today it's now sort of an accepted, uh, you know, part of the part of the overall role. Um, I, I think that the, the notion of influencers is a, is a funny one. Um, I have never been a fan of the mummy bloggers slash macro influencers slash mega influencers slash whatever and the ridiculous uh, fees they charge um, because they, they are not influencers, they are paid media. Um, they, they are borrowed mind, mind share at best and depending on how well or how not well you write your contract, they can end up working for your competitor in a month or two or whatever and saying the exact same thing for your competitor that they were saying for you. Um, so what, what, uh, what credibility does their, their voice and message have besides the fact that they can reach, you know, a million eyeballs? Um, I have always been a massive fan of the micro-influencer. And if you think back to the early days of, uh, of blogging, um, that's what bloggers are. They're micro-influencers with a passion for a certain subject. And, and I think that to the extent that companies can, they need to understand who those people are. Who are their passionate consumers? and engage them because I would rather have one authentic customer speaking to 150 or a thousand of their friends than I would have somebody speaking to a million of people that I don't really care about. Um, and so I, I think we're starting to see a bit of whiplash in, in the influencer space um, for that very reason uh, in, in saying that, you know, you know, is it, you know, will people still use them? Yes, we still use them uh, without question. Um, but I think that if you work harder and look look deeper and are willing to sort of play the long game, uh, the micro-influencer is definitely where it's at in terms of credibility and in terms of equity building uh, initiatives. Our friend, Professor David Kammer from Loyola Chicago is in the chat box and he's asking a similar question, but I think it goes just a little bit further in, into the idea of paid media and amplification. Uh, it's part of the strategy, isn't it? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you can, um, 
we actually have, we're launching next week, I think, a, 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 a basically an optimized PR offering, which is entirely search driven. Um, and, and thinking about the, the long tail life of a story. Uh, and basically what we, our data shows us is that any story that is not optimized for search going in um, has a basic monetary value of zero. Uh, and you can, yes, you can place it for those eyeballs that you might happen to get, but basically there's no long tail. Um, and, and so scenario A is you get the story in the first place in our media, that's awesome, you have to get it. But once you do, uh, the idea of being able to amplify that story and uh, and keep its life going for an extended period of time is huge. So that is, that is a huge part of our ongoing mix now. Um, and we'll look to things on a daily basis to say, great story, let's amplify this. And it doesn't even have to be, quite frankly, uh, something that uh, is you know placed in this country uh, or relevant you know to us. It's just it's some way that we can get a message that we're trying to get out there in a highly targeted fashion, uh, using programmatic buys and other, to uh, make sure that we are um, uh, we extend that life and, and are seen by more people for for a longer period of time. And I'll alert our other panelists later today that if any of you have a question, we'll be glad to dial you in to to ask Rick that question as well. I want to touch on what we've learned in the last 10 years that gives us some sense of what the PR world, what the digital space might look like in the year 2020, 2030. Um, so, you know, as we are here, it's, it's hard to completely predict the other side of the global pandemic, of course, and um, the, the social unrest that we've seen in 2020, uh, much less the election in 20 some odd days. But uh, the bigger picture, and that's the idea of these conferences, is to step back and see, you know, what's happening. The uh, the the point that David Matheson made earlier that that we're perhaps in the midst of some sort of fundamental revolution with these digital tools. Uh, what what does it say to you, Rick? Uh, I'd like to say I had a crystal ball looking ten years out, and hopefully in ten years out it sees me on a beach somewhere and uh, you know ni nicely retired. Um, but uh, by the way, I don't think that's happening. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'll keep working for as long as uh, as long as I can. Um, but I, I think that what you're seeing now is simply the beginning of accelerated change. Uh, we, we, we saw ten years of incredible progress um, that saw us now doing things today that I don't think many people would have predicted ten years ago with tools that are faster, thinner, smaller, entirely mobile, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think if you look ahead and you look at the, the potential that AI um, has uh, in terms of both helping and hurting our business uh, in automating things that are currently done manually, um, I think we need to continually refresh our skill set and mindset to make sure that we're staying as much as we can on the cutting edge of what's possible. Um, and again, I think there are minds much smarter than mine that are gonna be tasked with doing that um, and are already thinking about that in terms of, uh, of where that goes. But I think from a client perspective, there's no question this goes back closer and closer and closer, sadly in many cases, to um, absolutely precision uh, marketing and you know customized personal messages delivered when and where you want them exactly how etc um, or basically not even delivered because I think that we're you know we're we are already in an information on demand society that will become ever more so as we as we go forward and so it's you know as individuals will basically choose what we want to get um, how we want to get it where we want to get it etc cetera, etc cetera. But I mean, as, a, as an industry, as a, for instance, we haven't even begun to adapt yet. Um, if you think about, you know, your basic phone, you know, here you go. Uh, you, you look at that and say the, you know, I think Facebook's touting a stat right now that says 70% of people under the age of 30 will never look at their phone this way. You know, they'll always look at it this way. Well, then why are we shooting video this way if people's phones are like this? You know, why haven't we adapted in some ways to that? You know, that search, 10 years ago, Boolean, you know, now half of its audio. 
Um, and the search, the way people are searching is different. So how do we adapt to, to that, that environment? And so I think it's, I, well, there's no question that 10 years out, we will be significantly more advanced in so many ways, but the only way that any company, any individual can keep somewhat competitive in their skill set is to stay, stay on top of the game and make sure that you're surrounding yourself with people that are smart and aware of what's going on and what that actually can do for you in terms of uh, building brand, reputation, whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. We have students and professors on the call who are all chasing what you're talking about. Um, I, and I know you addressed this 10 years ago. Have any of the rules changed now going forward? Uh, the rules changed. You know, you touched on it already. I, I think that privacy is going to be a big rule that will come in, uh, number one. Number two, authenticity was always a rule. Um, the challenge, we're, you know, we touched on this, fake news. We touched on sort of, you know, the manipulation of data and, and being able to use technology today to basically create messages that look real but aren't. Um, and I think the, that's going to become a huge issue. And I think that consumers, individuals will reward companies that, uh, they not only perceive, but trust to be authentic, uh, and in, in terms of not only message delivery, but, you know, in authentic in terms of doing what's right. Um, and I do think that the, the idea that a company in 10 years ago, what we might have called cause marketing, and today some people are saying it is really pur being purpose driven or having, you know, connected on some level of purpose. I think that is going to play a massive deal in the next, uh, in the next decade. Uh, I, I think that most companies are still to this day paying lip service to it. They still put shareholder value and, and sort of the, the growth and shareholder value ahead of uh, the growth of um, uh, society. And uh, I think it's a, um, uh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be tough, but you look at companies that are doing it really well. We have a client uh, in TELUS and, and their CEO, that his mantra is something he calls social capitalism and it drives the agenda for the entire company. Um, we need more companies like that because the world has some massive problems and they're not going to get solved by government uh, or government alone, certainly. And so the private sector has to step up. Um, and I do think that's going to make it be a major part of how people make decisions going forward. Um, and as consumers vote with their wallet uh, to support companies that are leaning that way and, and working and doing that way, I think that you'll see a very different shaped world and message uh, as a result. As I've watched your work, Rick, one of the main points I've been struck by in terms of how this might feed into our curriculum is that the specialized practices, particularly right now, health practice, uh, energy, other really, you know, the topics that came up in the debate last night, all of those in a sense are specialized practices. What should students be doing? I mean, should they be specializing with a minor if they're going to have a communication PR major? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I don't know that you necessarily, I mean, it, look, if someone walked up to me and said, I've got a degree in communications and public health, I'd say, you're going to make a lot of money. Um, you know, there's, there's no question. And right now, today on the market, the demand for you know consumer PR professionals, as a for instance, is low. You know, and so it's a buyer's market from a talent perspective, and you know I you'll see that. I think if you look at tech, if you look at healthcare, if you look at public affairs and public policy writ large, those are areas that are growing. Um, and so I think that the, the best thing you can do to advance your as as an education, the best thing you can do to sort of you know improve your odds, so to speak is just developing multiple passions. And so if you are in a communications program, um, and I will fess up, I didn't take a single communications course when I was in school. Um, I'm an economics poli sci major and I, I, I turned out okay. Um, but I, I think that if you're in that program, I think having an area of specialty is, is key. That said, you don't need it. What you need to do is once you land in an organization, um, is sooner than later pick a way to specialize uh, in maybe one or two things. And so there's, there's very few people 
that are going through college, they're going to be able to, you know, sort of read, read you wrote the HIPAA, HIPAA regulations and healthcare privacy. Um, but I do think that's something that you need to learn quickly if you're going to be in healthcare communications. And so it's something that you can train, you can learn up on, and that's something that most companies will uh, will enable you to do. But um, honestly, I think it's 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 all tied to passion and uh, and so on. And if anything, I would say what continues to be lacking um, or the hardest thing to find, uh, believe it or not, in uh, in the communications professional are people that really are uh, critical thinkers, s solid critical thinking, and solid writers. Um, and so the comm skills are great, but basically the, the skills that you get in a liberal arts education as well, I think really, really serve you well in terms of being able to think about something analytically uh, and come up with the right solutions, then package that up in a way that uh, sounds uh, really coherent. I also have a follow-up question on the text chat about the convergence of advertising and public relations. And you talked earlier about paid media and how that has become important in PR. Is that a continuing trend that will look different 10 years from now? No, I think it will look even muddier uh, in, in 10 years. Um, I think that it's a, this started, I'm going to say, when I was at OM, we hired our first creative director in Chicago in 2010. Um, and I believe Edelman right now in the U.S. has about 15% of their total headcount uh, in sort of creative and uh, related roles. So it's, uh, it's changed dramatically in a short period of time. I, I think what you, you find, though, is if you're going to commit yourself to the path of, you know, there's, there's paid media and then there's being an advertising agency. Um, and then there's, you know, PR sort of over here. And where those areas converge is really around creativity. Um, and what, what we find, uh, and they see it, by the way, at the award shows as well, uh, at Con, is that the PR award is more often than not won by an ad agency. Um, not entirely, you know, there, there's been some exceptions to that, but there's an awful lot of really, really compelling PR work coming out of ad agencies. There's an awful lot of great advertising coming out of PR shops. And the, the um, uh, and I think well done. Um, any 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 agency is, is capable of producing anything. Uh, I think the danger for PR shops is not doing it as well as an ad agency. And so you become a very average ad agency, um, even if you're a great PR shop, as opposed to being the world's best PR shop, and you know, sort of focusing on what your your, your knitting really is, and then going out to the adjacencies where you can truly play. You know, as opposed to trying to sort of become a, you know, consumer equity building shop that's going to take on the likes of, you know, I don't know, Wyden Kennedy or somebody and, uh, and do that. And trust me, it's happening today. Um, we don't do that at Shift, by the way. Um, uh, we're, we're, we're focused on being the best possible, you know, PR shop uh, that we can be. We define PR broadly. Uh, and so we can help our clients in a lot of different ways, but we, we're not zeroed in on saying we want to be everything to you because uh, it's just not who we are. What about uh, public relations and media relations and journalism? Journalism is, has been in a free fall, as was mentioned last hour. Any concern about sort of the, the takeover of the narrative by, by PR? Uh, and, and, you know, some would say beyond persuasion into the realm of propaganda. <laughs> Who would say that? Um, no. <laughs> uh, is there a concern about it? I, I think that the media is pretty self-policing, although, again, I, I came from, I've spent five years in Canada and now back in, in Boston. Um, the Canadian media is still the media that the U.S. used to be for the most part. Um, they are objective. They will not use brand names unless you're getting arrested. Um, you know, they literally keep it church and state. And so earned media in Canada is, the, is, the, is doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, and it's a much harder play. Um, but similarly on the scale issue that we talked about, um, it, it's, it's uh, remarkable to me that you know, across Canada, there are, you know, a few TV networks. Um, there are a handful of newspapers. Um, but one of Canada's largest 
news media organizations uh, is Post Media. And Post Media now owns The Sun and so on, so roughly 200 papers across the country. And a friend of mine um, was the weekend editor for, uh, for Post Media. And they put out 200 papers across the country with two people. So th this is, <laughs> The, the, the amazing thing is the, is the consolidation of media is, is, is hard. Um, but people are consuming more news than ever before. Uh, people are, you know, it, it's not that there's not a demand there. It's just that there's not, the financial models have changed pretty radically. Um, and so I think, you know, in the future, I, and I hope, by the way, I hope you all do, if you subscribe to anything, I, I hope you support paywalls. Uh, because good journalism, it has to be funded in some way, shape, or form. Um, and so, you know, I've got subscriptions to the New York Times, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, et cetera, et cetera. And, and the Globe and Mail, um, still, still the Canadian piece. And I, I sort of, I look at every single one of them on a daily basis, but I have to pay for all that, you know? And I, I, I do think that we run into an issue where um, if we rely just on Facebook feeds for our news, um, we're not going to be a very smart society in 10 years. Last question I have for you, and then we'll see if others have anything to close this out. But, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk a couple of years ago about Facebook Libra and cryptocurrency. And, you know, as you talked about artificial intelligence and chat bots and all of that is certainly coming quickly. But uh, it's also the case, I think, that uh, natural language programming, uh, the, the use of strictly computers as opposed to humans is not a perfect science just yet. So will it be that 10 years from now? No, I don't, I, look, I hope we never take the humanity out of, uh, out of uh, our, our business. Um, I think it's a, you know, to this day, the, the lazy person's approach to this is to rely on tools for sentiment analysis, to, you know, you know, to rely on tools for tell to tell you what an article means, um, that has to be intuited by an individual, uh, or is best intuited by an individual. And while I think technology can always help us process information to an extent, um, the analysis of of what that information means, uh, and therefore what we can do with it, um, I think will always be the realm of uh, at least for the foreseeable future, in my mind. Uh, the, the realm of people like us, uh, of professionals in the communications profession or, or in, in, any, in any business for that matter. So I, I'm not really worried about humanity going away. Do I think some of our job will get automated? 100%. 100%. If you think back uh, 15 years uh, ago, it seems like a lifetime to many, and I'm sure half, half of the audience here and the students are, you know, going 15 years ago, like I was in kindergarten. Um, you know, but I, I think you sort of go 15 years ago, uh, an entry level job in public relations, you were handed a glue stick, you know, some tape and the, a pair of scissors, you know, and said you, you went and cut out articles and you taped them up and sent, you know, copied them and sent copies all over the place. And believe it or not, that was anywhere between five and 10% of an agency's revenue stream, you know, and so obviously that's all been replaced, you know, as, as we look at this, but it, it's not something that we, um, uh, well, we take it for granted today. So what parts of our job are likely to gonna get, will likely be automated going forward? I think reporting for sure. I think the story of these are the stories that are out there. It's already being done to a degree, but the licenses that you need to have and all these things, I think is sort of prohibiting that from happening faster. Um, but that'll get automated. I think reporting to a large degree will get automated uh, in terms of analytics. Uh, it, it will be one of those things our client will be able to press a button and go, how, did, how are we doing today? And if you walk in the newsroom of many, many uh, media outlets, New York Times or the Globe and Mail, uh, you'll see massive computer screens on the wall that talk about how the, the current articles of the day are being engaged with, uh, what parts of the articles are being engaged with, and then that's informing future content streams. So all of that, I think, will we'll have a much more, uh, we'll have more tools at our disposal, so to speak, to help us automate the process. And hopefully what that will do is free us up to do more thinking and, and to really think about how we take the data that we're being given 
um, and convert that into something that uh, that can actually help us accomplish something. Uh, so anyhow, I, I just I, I don't think you ever take humanity out. I think we've got jobs for life, but the jobs that we have won't be the same in 10 years that the jobs we have today. I continue to believe in narrative storytelling, but I do think it's going to be interesting in terms of the data to see whether the federal government in the U.S. lets states such as California and Illinois continue down the GDPR path and not weigh in. Um, they've had hearings in Washington, but not a whole lot of action on those fronts. So I do think there are some question marks going forward. Did any yeah, no. of our panelists going forward uh, have any follow-up questions? We've got about five minutes left. If not, Rick, uh, jump back in. I think you had something else to say. Uh, I think it was relative to GDPR. Uh, I, I think the, um, as best as I can tell, although it was a pain getting ready for it, um, it's come off relatively well, um, and I think most companies are learning how to operate within its confines uh, and constraints um, and don't find it all that restricting as a result. Um, so it's, it's been an interesting exercise, um, but it's almost like the do not call list. I mean, people will figure out ways around stuff and away you go. As you did a decade ago, Rick, you've helped us frame this conversation for uh, the morning and afternoon, and we so appreciate you taking the hour to do that with us. Well, I remember 10 years ago, Jeremy, and got to know you and Sandy since, and um, it's, a, it's an honor to be, be there uh, with everybody. I think that you've got a fantastic program, um, and uh, I will always come support uh, University of Nebraska Omaha and, uh, and, you, and your, you and your team. Well, I, I like the idea 10 years from now of trying to do this from a beach, so somewhere in October. Um, I think that, the technology that, that the first, is getting the there. First tea, the first tea or something like that. I, I'm actually talking to you from Arizona right now. We, are, uh, we were out here at the start of the pandemic and, and bought a house as a result. Uh, so I, I fly back and forth between here and Boston, uh, all socially distanced and masked and shielded and you name it, but uh, it is, um, uh, it's a, a good place to be. So anyhow, 10 years from now, I would love to come back and I will be absolutely irrelevant in 10 years. I guarantee it relative to everything that's being talked about. Thank you, Rick. It's been a pleasure.